this series, what we're talking about when we talk about culture is not necessarily the music that we listen to or the clothes that we wear. Every generation has their own sense of style. You can look back to when you were a kid and the things that you wore and the music that you listened to. Every generation. And as a matter of fact, the older that I get, the more I realize how cyclical those kinds of things are. The things that you once wore, all of a sudden you see the next generation wearing. You're like, I thought we got rid of that, you know? And it's back again with just something changed just a little bit. The same thing with music. It just seems to come around. It's less about that, although fashion and music can can be an extension of it. This is about the worldview around us, the culture, the way people think, what's acceptable, the, the way that they go about their lives. There are times when Christianity is more in line with culture in a good way, where it's easier to be a Christian, where the average person on the sidewalk tends to think the same way about the world that somebody who follows after Jesus does. And then there are periods of time in history where we would walk down that same sidewalk and it would be a little bit more difficult for us to identify some of the things that we believe are in the world about the world and some of the things that the world believes about itself. The good news is, is that whenever that happens, whenever it's a little bit harder to be a Christian, historically that's when the church has grown the fastest. Over and over and over, whenever you have to step into that faith and whenever it's real to become a Christian, when it's not the politically correct thing even often to be Christian and to have Christian values, that's when the church grows the most. And if we're going to step into that, if we want to be the kind of people that do take the gospel message of Jesus, his story about, in the war, about what he did in the world, if we want to be the people that take that further into culture, we're going to need something really, really important. And this morning, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about listening to God. Listening to God is the most important thing that we need. It's the most important thing that we need to be aware of when we're traveling through the world. And there's a reason for that. Whenever worldly pressure is on the rise, God's voice always gets louder. Whenever worldly pressure is on the rise, God's voice always gets louder. This is most clearly seen in the scriptures. In the Old Testament or the beginning of the Bible, whenever you read through the stories, especially the stories of the Samuels and the Kings and the Chronicles, all those books kind of in the middle, you, re you receive these stories of the nation of Israel, and there are times when they follow after God, and then there are times where they walk away from God. And whenever they walk away from God, one of the things that God always does is that he wants to be heard, and so he sends a prophet. And what would happen then is he would go and he would find a prophet. Normally it was somebody of good character who exemplified, you know, godlike living. And he would find that person and he would tell that person, I have a message for the people in the time that you're living. I have something that I want to say. I want these people to hear it. And so I'm going to give you this message. You take it to them. And normally always the message was, we know how to live. We need to turn back to God. We need to turn back to his ways. We need to be his people. Now, here's the cool thing about us today. God wants to work just slightly differently than that. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, this is what the scripture says. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the world. This is really, really cool. Here's what this scripture is saying. There used to be a time that when God spoke, he would only use one person. He would find that one prophet in one place and in different ways and in different circumstances use that one person to communicate something to all of the people. But now it's changed. Now that we have Jesus, and now that we can have a relationship with God, God doesn't need to use just one person anymore. God wants to speak directly to all of us. Jesus, it talks about in this passage that he has spoken in his son through, he's the heir of all things. Other passages also say that we are co-heirs with Christ. So in other words, what Jesus has started, being that heir, being the son that went to the cross on our behalf, we are also put in there with it. So that God wants to communicate directly with each one of us, the same way that he would talk to Jesus. 
What we want to do is learn how to listen. Not only has God made the way through Jesus so that he can talk to us, he doesn't need anyone else directly, he can talk to us. God has also positioned himself through the power of the Trinity to communicate with us. This is a really neat verse. In Ephesians 2.18, this is what it says. For through him, that him is Jesus, capital H him, for through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. This is a neat passage because it talks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all in one short, teeny tiny verse. And this is what it means. Because of what Jesus has done, through the power of the Spirit, we can now talk to the Father. But now, the reverse is also true. Because of Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, the Father can now talk to us. And that means that it's not only important that God made the way for this channel of communication to go, but that he uses everything that he has is positioned towards us so that we can speak to him and so that he can speak to us. The question is then, how do we listen? How does God speak to us? Because if Jesus has made the way and God has positioned his entire being so that we could have this kind of communication, then where's it at? How do we find it? What are we to be listening for? So the first thing that I want to talk about is how God speaks to us. The first one is by his voice. By his voice. This is direct communication. This is God speaking outside of our thoughts. This is not something that wells up from within us. This is something that comes from the outside in. Whenever God talks this way, it's always going to be clear. He directly communicates. God is a master of communication. If anyone is, God is, right? And so when God speaks, it is always clear. And when God speaks, it is always unmistakable. When you read through the stories of Scripture, whenever God spoke directly to someone, they never got up and said, I wonder if this is God. I'm not so sure, you know, maybe I need to go ask somebody about it, you know, sort of thing. They always got up and they said, God has spoken to me. A great story of this is with Jacob in the book of Genesis. Jacob is basically being chased for his life. He's supposed to be the one that uh, the, the whole nation of Israel is birthed out of, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, kind of the fathers of the faith sort of thing. And so he's running for his life. Nothing looks like what it should. And so God gives him a dream. And the dream basically is to affirm his role, that yes, the descendants would come, the nation of Israel would rise up from within. And what a great dream to have when you're on the run, right? God communicated exactly what he needed to. When he woke up from that dream, he said immediately, the place where he put his head down was called Luz, L-U-Z. The second he got up, he took the pillow, the stone that he was laying on, he stood it up on end, you know, to mark that spot, and he renamed the place and called it Bethel. And Bethel means the house of God. It was like instantaneous. He's like, God has spoken to me. There is no question about it. This place was called one thing. He renamed it because of what God had done in that spot. That's the sort of communication uh, that this is. Now, this happens less often. God speaking directly is not normally the norm that he wants to do. As a matter of fact, you look at a character like Moses, Moses doesn't get direct communication. The entire book of Exodus, Leviticus, you know, Numbers, Deuteronomy has this guy Moses in it, but yet he's 80 years old when God does this to him for the first time. So if it hasn't happened yet, you're okay. It's only happened to me actually one time in my life. I was in uh, college, I was studying, you know, to get my degree in biblical studies, and I was talking to my roommate. And this was a particular time, I don't know how we got on the subject, but for some reason, I just needed to puff myself up. And so I started talking to him just about how good my grades are, how good things are going, I'm taking Greek and Hebrew at the same time, and I'm acing both of those things, I'm talking loud, and I'm like, this is like the John show, I mean, I'm like a one-man band, you know, kind of doing the thing back and forth tooting my own horn, right? I was perfectly happy doing that, okay? And then all of a sudden, right in the middle, I received a voice outside of myself that said, who are you doing this for? Instantaneously, I started crying. Now, to my roommate, he's my best friend, to my roommate, this was like a moment of schizophrenia. 
All right, you're having a great conversation. This guy's telling you how awesome you are. You know, I mean, that's really the heart of it. Maybe it didn't sound that way to him, but that was my heart at the time. This guy's telling me how awesome you are. And then all of a sudden, tears. He's like, what just happened? Instantaneously, I knew God spoke to me. He's like, wait a minute, are you doing this for you? Are you in Bible college for you? Because if you are, you need to quit and go somewhere else. Or are you doing it for me? And I'm telling you, the whole rest of that evening, we had curfew, I broke curfew, I found a spot outside somewhere, and I spent some time with God, because God had some business to conduct with me that day. That's the kind of communication that this is. Sometimes it can be towards the positive, like it is, was with Jacob. Sometimes it can be that thing where God's like, you need to get back on track. But God will use his voice directly outside of our thoughts. My thoughts, I was perfectly happy talking about me. Outside of my thoughts, God communicated. The second way is more common. This is through our consciences. This is a little different. This is inside of our thoughts. This is from within us. A lot of times this will be the Holy Spirit communicating things to us in our thoughts. These are those moments where something just kind of peeks up in the back of your mind where for no reason you know that you should go help this person. Or from uh, out of the blue, you know that you should stop doing this thing and then start doing this thing. This is when God talks from within us. Now, these always require interpretation. If you've ever had that voice kind of well up from within and you're like, uh, normally what you'll respond with is, was that God? God, are you really talking to me right now? Or do you really want me to go over there and to pay for this person's meal? Just to cover it out. I don't even know that person, God. Or you really want me to pray for this person or to call this person? Or God, you're really telling me that I should stop doing these things and that I should start doing these things in my life? That's the sort of thing. Normally, this requires interpretation. One of the ways that you can interpret it, we'll talk about it in a second, is really through the word. Another way we'll talk about later on is through relationships. But I'll tell you the one that's easiest for me, the one that I look for first to know that God is speaking to me. And that's when it's contrary to my nature where it's contrary to who I am. Most often when God speaks like this, it will be something that's not normal for you. If it's normal for you to do a thing, then God doesn't need to say anything. All he's got to do is point you in the position and then you'll naturally do it. I'll tell you where this shows up in my life. I'm not the best server in the world. I don't really have the gift of hospitality. Like when we do like a get together at our house, I'm the guy who's like in charge of the games. You know, I want to put together the games. I want to put together the fun time. I, at Thanksgiving, I like deep frying the turkey, but I'm not good at anything else, okay? And so my wife, on the other hand, is the hospitality person. If it was up to me, you'd be like an hour into our party, and you wouldn't even have a drink yet. I wouldn't, it wouldn't even be on the top of my mind. Everybody would be dying of thirst in the desert, and I'm thinking, the game's about ready to start, you know, that sort of thing. Now, whenever I receive a thought in my mind that tells me to serve someone, I know that since I am not naturally wired that way, that is God telling me to do something. Whenever God puts that on my heart and it just comes up from within and God says, go over there and take care of that person or pick up that phone and call this person or show up and do this on their behalf, ask them how you can help, whatever those things, that is so contrary to my nature and what comes natural to me, I know always that that's what God is speaking to me. It's very easy to discern then. And it will work the same way in your life as well. When God talks to you, when God has something to speak to you, just ask yourself, is this something that I would normally do? Is this really who I, and if you can answer that question and it's not really who you are, then you know, you know that God is speaking to you, that God has something to say to you. The last one is through his word. God has spoken in his word. Now, this is the message that we have received as a people. It's really, really cool that way. God's word is his scriptures. This is what we talk about with the Bible. It's the story about what God has done throughout history. Not only did God work and act and do many things throughout history, he had people write it down. He moved in people's lives and said, record this. I want future generations to know what kind of a God I am, what kind of a person I am. That's what God did through his scriptures. What's nice about that is it's the instruction, it's God's communication to us that unifies us as a people. The same stories that we've been looking at for thousands of years that are guiding us, leading us, God is speaking to us through that. 
Well, how in the world can a document written to people with no education in the desert on the other side of the world be important to us? How, how in the world can we draw anything from that? Well, the word is alive and active. In Hebrews 4.12, this is what it says. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What all that piercing language is really all about is it's a metaphor saying that the word of God is able to instruct us. It's able to cut things right in half. It's able to say this is this and that is that. And we can go to it for that instruction. The way that the scriptures say that it's able to do that is because it's living and active. When God speaks, it is an extension of himself. It is alive. When God communicates, it is alive. It is active. That's the reason that we can read the same story thousands of years later, and it still has meaning for us. Because God's words are not dead. God's words can still move in our world even today. And this is a very, very good way for us to hear from him. It's also the way that we can measure everything else. God's word is the standard of truth. It's the one way that we can judge everything else by. If you want to know that thought in my head, that communication that I feel like I received from God, if you want to know for sure that's from God, one of the easiest ways, after the ones we've already talked about, one of the easiest ways to take a look at that is to measure it up to his word. To measure it up to who God has already told us that he is. Because if it matches that, then it's from God. If it contradicts that, then it's not from God. It's the way that we can always judge all of his communication. So he wants to talk to us directly with his voice. He wants to talk to us through our consciences. He also wants to talk to us through his word. And the bottom line is that if we will listen to God, it will change our lives. It will change our lives. You want to be the difference maker in the world? You want to really live counterculture? You want to stand up for Jesus? You want to be the kind of person who can do that? If you will listen to God through these things, if you will look for him in your life, for his voice, through your conscience, if you will seek him in his word, he'll communicate to you through that, this is going to change your life. Listening to God is going to help us, it helps me to slow down. I think the number one thing in our culture that does war against our soul is none of the things that you see on the news, but it's everything you see in the commercials. It's hurry sickness. We live so hurried that we can never, ever, ever hear from God. It does enemy, it's a war against us constantly. It's layer upon layer upon layer of things and things and stuff and desires and busyness and all of these things. What happens is all of it just gets heaped on us and heaped on us and it's no wonder that we can't hear the voice of God. We've got 10 other voices trying to speak to us at the same time. Guys, maybe you can identify with this. There's a phenomenon that happens in our house. I'm a gamer, I like to game. And um, there's a phenomenon that'll happen in our house. It'll be time to game. I just need some downtime. I'll pop in that game. I'll be playing on it. Supposedly, theoretically, my wife says she can have an entire conversation with me. And I'm focused on this game. And apparently, I can even respond and say, yeah, okay, good. Uh Uh-huh. After it gets done, I don't remember what she said. She'll come to me later on and she'll be like, hey, don't you remember we talked about this thing? Be like, you never talked to me about that. You were, she'll be, you were sitting right there playing your game and you said yes. I'm like, did I look at you? <laughs> did, I, did I turn over? We have this thing now where she has to make me make eye contact, okay? Put the controller down, make eye contact with that. Some of you ladies, I can see you. You're like, this is you, you know, with your sports games or, you know, whatever. It's that sort of thing. My attention is totally on something else and I wasn't really able to hear her. I was able to nod and to look like I heard her but I didn't really hear her. I'm telling you, this kind of thing is what happens in the world. Busyness, hurry, moving from this to this to this. I've got to do 10 things at one time right now. Can't do it fast enough. It's no wonder that we can't hear from God, but the opposite is also true. If we will stop and listen to him, spend time with him in his word, through prayer, in expectation, it will naturally slow us down. 
You know, the scriptures say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The story, the context, what's happening around that particular verse is Jesus is talking about worry just in general. He's talking about the, the bird worrying about the worm and the grass worrying about the rain and all of these things that would keep us busy and moving and moving and we got to make it rain and we got to find that worm and you know, all the different things. Jesus is like, slow down, stop. If you will seek the kingdom, his kingdom, Jesus, and his righteousness, his kind of living, right living, if you will seek that, God will work out all the rest. That is a lot less hurried pace, isn't it? It's a lot slower. That's why a lot of people are able to hear from God better in nature. Maybe you're that one of those people that when you get outside and you walk a trail or you go to the park, you just feel God's presence better. You just feel like you can hear from him, that somehow your prayers are more effective. What is it? I mean, did you move to the park and God has a better channel of communication? He's got like five bars of signal at the park and only one bar of signal at the house? It doesn't work that way, right? No, you slowed down. God's been talking the whole time. God's omnipresent here everywhere. He's been there the whole time. What did you do? We slowed down. Music does the same sort of thing. How many of you feel like God speaks most directly to you through music? Why? Because all of your attention is focused on him. You're singing these words. Everything around you is pointed in that direction. Circumstances will often do this. I've had people tell me that they've been happy that they lost a job because they realized that their relationship with God, that the job was robbing from that. That now that they've lost the job, they feel more connected to God. What a contrary notion. Or I know people that have gone on a mission trip and because the mission trip totally changed everything, the time they got up, what they did throughout the day, the time they went to bed, because it reordered their entire life, now they feel like God's presence is with them and that has, God has spoken to them. That's one of the things that makes mission trips so powerful to do, to get away for a week and to serve God differently. It re-energizes us. Nothing changed on God's end. Everything changed on our end. And now we can hear from him. Listening to God will slow us down. Listening to God will also bring me true freedom. True freedom. Have you ever had the thought that, um, <laughs> that if you really sold out to Christianity, that if you really did everything the Bible talks about, that you basically would have no fun anymore? That if I really stopped doing all these different things, if I really got on this Jesus bandwagon, then all the fun's going to be gone. Christians have no fun. You guys all look the same, talk the same, you know, really whatever. Romans 8.15 says this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. This is what this is talking about. If we will listen to God, our fears often, we're going to be weird, we'll be slaves. If I really do this, God's going to ask me to do some weird stuff or push me in a weird direction. I don't, I don't want to be weird. I, I just I want to be somehow normal in the middle of it. Here's what the scriptures are saying. You think that selling out to God, that saying, God, I'll do whatever you say. I'll listen to you, I'll do. You think that that leads to a position of slavery. This is what Paul is saying in this passage. Real slavery is trying to do life without God. Try to do life, remember what it was like before when you didn't have God as direction throughout your day. When you didn't know how to live. When all you could do was go from bad thing to bad thing to receive the consequences of those things. Try to live a life where you don't know what's going to happen after you die. You don't have an ultimate purpose within the world because God's not leading us on a global mission to spread his message. Live that kind of, now that is a life of slavery. A real life of freedom is adopted. We are part of God's family by which we can communicate with God because he is our Abba Father. He's our daddy. That's a life of real freedom. And if we will do that, if we will listen to God, if we will position ourselves that way, what the scripture is saying is that you think you're going to be led towards this slavery sort of thing, you're really going to be led towards freedom. In Christ, not only can we do that, oh, and I want to mention something on this, relationships are great for this. Relationships are great. You think you're going to do something weird, 
and it's going to, uh, you don't want to do that weird thing. Relationships can help you to do the weird things and to not feel as weird about them. I'll tell you what this looks like. In the third grade, I've shared this with you guys before. In the third grade, I had a mullet and MC Hammer pants at the same time. I'm dead serious. Mullet, hammer pants, going on, same time. I saw the people with mullets, and I saw the people with hammer pants, and I said, yes. I brought those things together in the middle. When I did that, I look back now, I'm like, that was really weird. It was not the weird thing in the moment. In the moment, it was awesome. You know, why choose? I'm going to do both. You know, that's what we did, you know, during the time. You, you laugh. You guys had your own things. I know. It's in there. I wish we could all share pictures. But here's the thing. If we will listen to God, if we will be willing to do the weird things that, we want, that he asks us to do, if we will do that in the context of relationships, through your small group, through godly friendships that you can build here, whatever that looks like, if you will do it, the thing that you are most afraid of is infinitely easier to do because you've got other people that want to do it with you. All right, it'll lead you to freedom. The, the other thing is, in Christ, I can be secure before the Lord. We often feel insecure when it talks about this relationship relating with God in this way. I'll tell you how we know that. Can God really hear me? Will God even listen to a person uh, like me? Would God really talk to me? We often say this because we're like, I, I know what I did five minutes ago. You're telling me God's going to talk to me. This is what the scripture says in John 17. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may per be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. This is really cool. Jesus is preaching this or, or praying this with his disciples right before he goes to the cross. This is one of the last things that he does with them. And this is what he's saying. He's, this is a prayer on their behalf. And he says, Father, as you and I are one, because Jesus is son, God is father. They're one, right? It's one God, three persons. This is Trinity thing going on again. Jesus says, just as you and I are one, God, I am here. This mission that Jesus has is to bring these people, these followers, one with you. Like we're one, I'm praying that you would become one as well. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus made the way that we can be one with God. We can have that kind of relationship with him. This has profound impact on us. Imagine if you walked in to uh, the largest company you can think of. You walked into General Motors, you walked into Apple headquarters, you walked into the White House, whatever it is. You walked in, went to the executive suite or walked into the Oval Office, you kicked your shoes off, you, you unbuttoned a button that was on there, you took your belt off and hung it on the side, you got on the couch, you laid down, put your hands behind your head in that kind of posture, you know, whatever it was, you walked right in there. Slightly after you get gang tackled by security, they ask you, on whose authority are you here? And you say, well, my own authority. I'm a taxpayer, or I own stock in this company, or I have an iPhone, whatever that thing is. I'm here by my own authority. What they're going to do is to drag you to a really small room with really bright lights, <laughs> And they're going to have a chit-chat with why you can't go in there and do those things. Now imagine the same thing happens, and at the end of it, you say, I am here because the president invited me. I am here because the CEO invited me and said that I could come here today. In other words, I am not here by my own name because my name doesn't have the authority to be here. But I am here on the name and in the power of the name of the person who's really in charge. This is what this means. When you go to God, when you are listening to God, you are not before him under the power of your own name. When you go to God and you listen before him, you are there before him under the power of the name of Jesus. Jesus said the relationship that you and I have, Father, because of what I'm doing, I grant that to them so that in my name, they can come before you and hear from you. I'm telling you, Jesus wants us to have security, not to feel insecure. You're wondering, can God talk to me? Really? Me? Left to ourselves? No. Left to the power of Jesus in the name of Jesus? Absolutely. Not only does he want to do it, he wants to do it today, right now. God's got things to say. And here's the power of this. Here's the power. This is what we're finishing on. If we will listen to God, we can be 
the difference in the world around us. If we will listen to God, we can be the difference in the world around us. Do you know the story of Noah? The story of Noah and the ark and the rain and the flood and all that. Noah preached for 120 years that it was going to rain. Nobody had ever seen this before. Nobody had ever seen rain like this before. Nothing had ever happened like this. He's building a boat. They don't know what boats are. They're looking at it. You're crazy. He did it for 120 years, said rain's coming, build a boat or drown. It's up to you. Whatever this looks like, 120 years. How many times did God have to tell him to do that? Once. God told him one time. Because God changed the world. He found the one person that would listen to him, and he changed the world with that person. And you know what? We hear that, and sometimes we make a fatal mistake. We think, man, if I only would have listened to God back in the day, or if I only would have listened yesterday, our thoughts immediately go to our past. We think about all these other times, and I'm telling you, that is the biggest mistake we can ever do with a piece of information like this. We do that because we don't understand God's grace. We do that because we don't understand what it means for God to be our father and to love us unconditionally. Because what God wants you to do with that is to not think about the past. Jesus paid for all of that. Every time we haven't listened, every time I haven't listened, Jesus paid for all of that. God wants you to think about the future. God wants you to know that if you will just listen to him the next time he speaks, the next time that God has something to say, if you will just listen to him, he will change your life and he will change the world around you. Try it once. Try it just one time. The next time God speaks to you, try it. Do it. See what it does in your life. See what it does to who you are. See what it does to the people around you. And I guarantee you, you'll be hooked. Because God never leaves something the same after he touches it. He always makes it better. He'll always make us better, and he'll always make the world around us better. You want to be countercultural? Listen to God. <laughs>